First Africa and its ability and its um, ability to tackle some of the biggest challenges facing the world today hinges on how we implement the right structures that will lead to sustainable and inclusive development. In this forum today, we are going to hear from a vast panel of speakers who are actively reshaping economies and leading the transformation in their respective spheres. Um, we truly hope you enjoy the sessions as much as we did organizing it. I will, now give, I will now give it over to our dear president of IE University, Santiago Iniguez, for his opening words. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, and good afternoon to all of you. I'm delighted to welcome you to the annual IE Africa Business Forum this year, entitled Prosperous Africa, Inclusive Growth and Sustainable Development. Thank you to the IE Africa Club, especially Club President Praise Deb Debkop, for organizing this event and congratulations on the excellent program you have put together. IE University has been working on the continent of Africa, recruiting students, working with companies, supporting our alumni, conducting research, now for more than 10 years with offices in Lagos and Johannesburg. Under the leadership of our director for the Middle East and Africa, Sabine Yazbek, we have also launched the, I, the Africa at IE initiative, which tracks all of IE's engagement and activities across the continent. Recent highlights include a virtual startup competition in partnership with the South Summit and a conference series with Africa Communications Week. Nearly three years ago, IE decided to deepen its investment in Africa by creating the IE Africa Center, which is led by Felicia Penteng. The center's mission is to shine a light on African solutions to global challenges through the creation of new academic content, media, and custom programming for social investors. Recently, the center has launched an academic accelerator, Gurus and Grayos, you may have heard of it, which creates academic content that centers the expertise and experience of Africans and Afro-descendants. This new liquid content will be incorporated across all IE courses so that we can all continue to learn from and to grow with Africa. Of course, one of the most important ways in which we can all learn from Africa is the area of sustainability, which is precisely the theme of today's conference. Africa's sustainable growth is essential to global progress, and today we will explore the many opportunities in policy, energy, technology, and entrepreneurship so that we can all build towards a better future together. Thank you again for sharing this time with me and congratulations on this wonderful event. Allow me, since I see lots of fam familiar faces on the screen and uh, lots of them probably also, I cannot actually look at all at once. But uh, again, you know, thank you for organizing this wonderful event. We feel proud of having you on board. And of course, as you can imagine, we plan to run many more things related to the continent and to all, both African citizens as well as African descendants. So thanks very much for this initiative. I hope I can attend uh, at least some of the presentations. And of course, count on me for pushing ahead any initiative related to Africa. Thanks very much and congratulations. I'm back to you, Grace. Thanks so much, Santiago. Uh, wonderful words. Uh, and thank you very much, Praise, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'd now like to take this moment to introduce uh, our keynote speaker uh, for the afternoon, uh, Mr. Khaled Ige, uh, who is an economist and investment banker. He's currently the managing partner and Africa chairman of BNA Investment Bankers. If it's not, if any more, he's also the author of the book Time for Africa. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Mr. Ige, I'd like to welcome you to the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody and good afternoon. So first of all, I'm very happy and very delighted to be with you this afternoon. And I would like to thank uh, the team for the organization and to thank also Praise for the invitation. And I think the main question today is to see how we can create an, 
um, an economy that will be inclusive on the continent, also sustainable development. I think that's a very important point. Uh, you know, the, the fact that we are we are not yet at the, at the uh, con to, uh, we are not yet now at the point that we have an inclusive economy is is, uh, is uh, due to two important points. The first one is historical, and the second one is economic. Okay, the first point that is historical is that in 1960, after the independence of African countries, we mostly have leaders that were either director or unionists or professors, and they were very nationalist. And the main challenge for them at that point was to find a way and to find a politic model and political system to run our countries. So they were main focused on democracy, political system, than economy. That's the first point. The second point that is economy is that we did not create a lot of companies, a lot of corporates at that time that will create enough jobs for African, for African people at that time. So that are very big points that are, uh, I would say that shame or that shape the, the system, the economy system that we have on the continent at that day. And to explain a little bit, um, after the colonization, post-colonization, our economy was es essentially primary economy and tertiary economy. I will explain why. We do not have industries or transformation industry that will allow us to transform our natural resources or agriculture at that time. And we lack also a lot of energy system at that time as well. But today the system is very different because we are progressing a lot on this point. We are not creating a lot of industries to transform the natural resources on the continent. So it's a little bit different. So since 10 years, we have a GDP growth that is average 5% on the continent. That is very great. But at the moment I'm talking to you, as you know, we have the COVID-19 since 2020. And the problem of COVID-19 is that African continent lost $200 billion of GDP from 2020 to 2021. And the problem is that we have to find a way to finance the economy of the continent post COVID. That's very, very important at that moment. And as you know, uh, there's a summit that has been held in Paris uh, five days ago, so last week, to know how we can finance African economy post COVID. The essential point is that, and the essential question is how we can use the special drawing rights for the IMF, International Monetary Fund, to fund the economy of the country and to inject liquidity in the economies. For you to know, today at the moment I'm talking to you, IMF is issuing $600 billion of what we call special drawing right to finance the world economy, but only $34 billion had to go to Africa. So the, the, the advocacy that we economists, we African economists are doing today is to know how we can increase for $34 billion to $100 billion. The, the point is to raise this point, what we call rich countries or OECD countries should give to Africa a part of their financing to help the continent. And this is the kind of point that we are challenging today to see with the international community, how we can be uh, more focused in the African economy to find this new, I would say new way of financing. Just for you to know as well, Africa have a deficit of $100 billion of financing in, in, in its, its infrastructure for the next 10 years to come. The total is worth more than $1,000 billion. So we have to fund today, as I'm talking to you, $1,000 billion for the next 10 years to come to finance the African infrastructure. If we want to create enough job 
for the youth on the continent for the 10 years to come. We have to create 10 million jobs per year on the continent. As you know, 70% of Africans living on the continent have age under 25 at the moment. This is a great potential for the continent, but it's also a great fear for the continent if we are, we are not able to create those jobs. So what can be a solution for that? What we are proposing today as economists on the continent is to be able to create a fund, a world fund for the continent to invest on the economy. This world fund can be one part for financing and the second part for guarantee. But guarantee for what? Guarantee for the companies, guarantee for the private investment because the problem of the continent is the perception of the risks that the investor have for the class on the continent. Most of the time, investors are thinking the continent as a global economy, but the continent is 54 countries, it's 54 economies, and each country has a different economy. So we, can, we cannot think the continent as a unit, as one economy as well. So what we are also advising today is to have a sort of bilateral, um, I say coalition, a bilateral exchange with the countries of the continent to be able to go beyond the risk of the, percep the perception of the risk that we have today. But Africa do not need, does not need only infrastructure or transport infrastructure. We also need to build energy infrastructure and with the, grid, with the green revolution, we can today, as the moment I'm talking to you, build the green energy, biomass, solar energy, hydraulic. So we have a lot of solution to produce energy on the continent today. This is a very important point. The last point is about health, as we are talking about COVID. We are also lacking $30 billion per year to build hospital on the continent to be able to respond to the COVID. And also to buy vaccine, to have a very policy for the vaccination on the continent. So what I'm trying to explain today is that we cannot just uh, step to the fact that every time we have a crisis, economic crisis, health crisis or financial crisis, on, in the world, we can just focus for Africa in even canceling debts or canceling what we call the service of the debt, the interest risk on the debt. We can just keep on that. We have to go beyond this point. We have to find the financing model, uh, uh, I would say uh, a new financing model to allow the continent to be able to finance its economy, to finance the, the companies that are creating jobs on the continent. So this is what I want to share with you this, this afternoon, but because it's very important to keep in mind that Africa have a great potential. We have the natural resources. And the only way to keep the African the continent is to create jobs on the continent. And we need to create 10 million jobs per year. And for that, we have to invest a lot on the economy of the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yige, for those very inspiring words on how we should be looking to create new financial models uh, for investing in the African economy. Um, so at this point, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce our first panel. Um, and I would like to also remind the audience that uh, you're more than welcome to uh, pose your questions in the chat. And at the end of the panel, we will take five to 10 minutes uh, to go ahead uh, and read through your questions from the audience. Uh, our first panel is going to focus uh, on the role of tech, digitalization, and entrepreneurship in accelerating progress and in inclusivity. Our speakers today are Eloine Berry, the CEO of Africa Media Agency, Anish Shivdasani, the founder and CEO of Giraffe, Rafael Ani, the head of external commercialization for Telefonica in Waira, UK, and Jake Bediako, the presidential coordinator for youth engagement and strategy at the office of the president of the Republic of Ghana. 
Today's panel will be moderated by Paris de la Trat, our Head of Entrepreneurship and Managing Director of the Venture Lab here at IE University. Welcome to all. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Let's get going. Uh, well, you heard it from Mr. Igwe that we need to create 10 million jobs. And it's very likely that a lot of those jobs are gonna be created by startups. Startups are the engine of growth in many of the developed countries today, and they will be in Africa as well. So as we talk, bring this discussion into entrepreneurship, let's talk about inclusion and sustainability. At the Venture Lab, we've had more African startups than ever before every year. And it's amazing to see how they lead the way even before COVID with respect to sustainability and inclusion. As Santiago mentioned earlier, we just had a South Summit virtual event on Africa last week. And it was amazing to see the quality of the startups that are coming from that continent. But I think it's only gonna get better. And because I think what we're seeing is this new trend. And as Mr. Igwe also said, we need investment. And the money that is pouring into Africa today for startups is amazing. It truly is. So let's begin. I'm gonna start with Rafael Ani. Rafael, how are you today? I'm fine, good afternoon, Paris. Good to see you, okay. So let's talk about sustainability, Rafael. How is this trend affecting African startups today? And I know you have quite a bit of experience in the telco world. How are telcos helping this trend and this development of startups in Africa today? Well, thank you very much for, for, for that question, Paris. Um, in my opinion, what I've seen that has happened in the continent of late is um, we've gone through the initial stages where we were invested in impact companies that were actually not as profitable and now moving to build on real businesses that could become global power. And with that comes the capital, which you actually alluded to, more money is now coming into the space. But one of the things that actually has started happening in the continent is that the, what I call the big brothers, the established companies that co across the continent are realizing that they have the role to support these smaller companies to actually become larger because this is how we do it here in the West. And with specific uh, to telcos, I say to people, um, if you think of what we call digital uh, uh, innovation today, you're doing one, one of three things. You're either creating new sets of data or you find an insights from data that has been collected or you're transferring information in ways that have not been transferred before. And in all three scenarios, you need telcos because two things has happened to the world. We have faster processes and bigger pipes to transfer data. So because the telcos are the backbone of what we call digital, digital transformation or digital innovation, the telcos stand in a very special place to be able to support the startups like they've done in financial services and now have started to do in energy. And I hope they're doing it in healthcare and other sectors. So. Um, the likes of MTN are now having specific teams that, looks, that look at startups because this is also not just a CSR uh, for purposes. It's also a way to remain relevant because what telcos are now doing is that for either to allow themselves to be self-cannibalized, they're now supporting these companies to be, become bigger corporations. So this is what I'm seeing happening in the continent. And when you have these big telcos getting involved with startups, then investors, both locally and internationally, have more confidence to come into the market and actually invest in these companies. That's, that's, that's what I've seen as the trend. And because they are mostly digital, they are mostly sustainable. That's what I would say for now. Okay. And tell me, I know that you've been involved with Wira in the past. Do you see similar efforts in Africa? Yes. Yeah, so... Um, one of the things that really happened very well in the telco world is that a lot of the telcos speak to each other because we have to do roaming. <laughs> so we have a, a uniform standard. And one of the things they've also, and what we, and if you look at the traditional business model of telcos today, it's voice, text, and data. Those, are, those have been commoditized. There's no difference with, between the voice and text that Vodafone will give me or MTN will give me. So, and they all are seeing that for, for you, what, what, why are, the reason why, um, uh, Payette set up Waira was that he said, instead of fighting innovation, let's enable innovation. That dream has actually made Telefonica 
uh, you know, a, a, an admirable company via the telcos. So all the telcos around the world, the MTNs of this world, are now looking at what he did, seeing that vision, and trying to replicate it in their own market. And I, if I may make a point, what also I'm seeing happening is that a lot of startup founders, a lot of entrepreneurs, are seeing what what has Telefonica has done in Spain and in the, and, and Latin America, especially. Um, and wanting to do a copy and paste of the business models, knowing that the telcos in Africa will be very receptive to those models. Great. Thanks, Raphael. Now, remember, audience, you'll have a chance to ask questions to Raphael and the rest of the panelists in a few minutes. So don't uh, miss out on this opportunity. All right, we're going to keep going here. Uh, I'm now going to ask questions of Anish. Anish, how are you today? How's it going, Paris? Good speaking it's to you. Good. And, and hello good to everyone to else too. as well. So Anish, um, I mean, we're, tr we're living in a truly global world and entrepreneurship is something that is taking time in some uh, markets. I remember when I got to Spain 20 years ago, I'll never forget, uh, there was this, uh, a, a young person that I knew. And when he told his parents that he was going to be an entrepreneur, the father looked at him and said, why can't you get a real job? You know, um, and, and what we're seeing, and I'm, I'm now right now in, in Dubai, uh, we started to travel here. I've just uh, done a bit of a tour in Saudi Arabia and on my way back through Dubai. And I'm seeing that also in the Middle East. Well, before entrepreneurship, there was sometimes like a stigma around being a successful entrepreneur. Now they're becoming role models in society and people are looking up to these successful entrepreneurs and people are seeing it as a, as a viable career, you know? Um, so tell me about the job market in Africa over the last 10 years. And where do you see entrepreneurship? Because as we heard earlier, we need to create a lot of jobs. And a, a lot of those jobs need to come from entrepreneurship. Are, are people starting to look at this as a viable option after university? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> and maybe, maybe I can divide my answer into two parts. And that is, first of all, you know, what has happened to the African labor market over the last 10 years or so? And what are the consequences in terms of the need for entrepreneurship in the future? Right. So if we look kind of back at the last 10 years or so, there have been two um, key forces, in my opinion, shaping um, the structure of, of the African labor market. And, and both of these forces are a little bit scary. Right. The first one is a phenomenon known as premature deindustrialization. Uh, and the second force is effectively the fact that Africa's population growth is going faster than the, the size of the workforce, right? Um, so let me talk about the first one first, premature deindustrialization. Now, when you look at how countries evolve, how countries' economies develop over time, they typically follow this pattern where they start off being agriculture focused, then they move into industry and manufacturing, and then they move into uh, high level services like you know, banking, legal services, IT services. And that has been the kind of uh, normal pathway for economic development, where each stage of development creates more value that is used to invest in creating the next stage. So agriculture is relatively low value, manufacturing kind of is a bit higher value, that creates more wealth, and then you move into services. And that's certainly what happened in Europe, and it's what's happened in the US, and it's what's happened in China. But the problem has been that around about, let's say, the 90s or noughties, for instance, um, globalization meant that China became the world's manufacturing workshop, if you like, right? Um, and most manufacturing was effectively outsourced to China. And that was around about the time when I would say Africa was moving from a more agriculture focus to what should have been a manufacturing focused type of economy. The problem, though, is that China is now uh, a globally competitive uh, a manufacturing hub, which has such huge economies of scale that Africa has been unable to compete. So Africa was meant to go from agriculture to manufacturing and then continue. But unfortunately, it's not been able to make the transition from agriculture to manufacturing. And that has resulted in this premature deindustrialization, where Africa has had to leapfrog from agriculture to services. Right now, that's bad because what's happened is that it hasn't been able to create the wealth necessary to continue along that economic developmental path. And it has not been able to create the jobs that are necessary to continue that growth. Okay, so that's the first problem or first force. The second force is over the last 10 years or so, you know, the African uh, um, 
uh, population growth has been around about 3% per year. But the workforce, number of people actually joining the workforce has been about um, uh, 1.5% per year. So for instance, last few years, 18 million people per year have entered the African workforce. Only between say three and five million people have been able to join the workforce. And so you've got this very uh, fast growing population, young population, but youth are, are simply not able to enter the workforce because there are not enough jobs available. Now these two forces have coalesced and combined and formed quite a, a dangerous mix if you think about it, because on the one hand, we don't have the manufacturing base that could propel us to higher value, and we don't have enough jobs to, to absorb people into the workforce. Okay, cool, so what's my point, right? My point is that we need to now deal with this situation, right? And now let me kind of get to the crux of my answer to your question. Because there are not enough jobs being created in Africa, there is no choice but for entrepreneurship to happen. Because if that doesn't happen, then effectively you're gonna get mass unemployment that's just gonna increase with time. Now, let's look at what's happened over the last 12 months or so, because this is also relevant. COVID has hit the whole world, okay? And it's, you know, as, as per the, um, the, the keynote speaker Khaled was saying, it's really whacked the African GDP. But at the same time, it's actually created an opportunity. Now, there, were, there are two areas I'd say where COVID has created an opportunity. And that is, first of all, um, um, remote work is now uh, widely accepted, right? Uh, and so what that means is that the talent pool is no longer defined by geography. There is now a global talent pool that can be tapped in everywhere, right? So now, for instance, an African uh, a programmer can now work for an American company. That was the case before, but this is now more feasible, right? Um, um, the, the second uh, point is that digital transformation has happened to a, a very, very rapid pace. In fact, the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, said that uh, when COVID hit, after COVID hit, there were kind of two years worth of digital transformation that were achieved in two months. And what that means is the demand for uh, an adoption of, of digital things has, has significantly increased. Okay, cool. So where does that leave us in terms of where we're going to go from here? We're at a kind of very important crossroads whereby we need the youth in Africa to be employed, to work, to contribute to the economy, right? And I think the only way that's gonna happen is by effectively increasing the amount of service economy or services that Africa can provide to the rest of the world. And India is a good example here. If you look at India, um, India has huge numbers of developers and outsourcing is happening there in a big way, right? We need to do something similar in Africa. We need to um, develop um, 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 the youth so that they're able to participate in the digital economy. And I think this is probably the most pressing thing. I, I think that educating the youth is probably the most important thing here. Educating them on how to become programmers or digital marketers or data analysts or whatever, because that's where the huge demand globally for talent is gonna be, right? And I think the second thing is that again, to Khaled's point, we need to incentivize foreign companies to recruit Africans or to set up operations in Africa so that they can help drive employment. Accenture, I'll give you an example. Accenture, I'm sure you guys know, it's a very large global company, has half a million employees um, um, globally. They have 150,000 staff in India doing kind of service outsourcing. They have about 50,000 staff in the Philippines doing similar kind of stuff. They have 50 global delivery centers doing, let's say, a high value or service type work, they only have two of those del delivery centers in Africa. So you have to ask the question, why is that, right? Can Africa become a better um, recipient of, of foreign companies hiring here and, and being positioned here? So I think those are the two key things we need to focus on. Educating the youth, and I'm sure Jake is gonna talk about this uh, just now, educating the youth so they can contribute in the, into the digital economy and encouraging or lobbying for foreign companies to hire from here so that we don't necessarily have to do everything on our own. And sorry, that was a kind of long-winded answer, but that's basically uh, the point. No, Anish, I, I thought um, your, your answers were very insightful because th those are exactly the issues. Now, as I said, I, I'm just coming back from, uh, from Saudi Arabia, uh, where the United Nations World, Tra World Tourism Organization 
has just set up their first office and uh, IE is very closely working with them. And back to your point, the reason why I bring up tourism, Spain was in a very similar situation to the one you described. Uh, Spain came from an industrial economy and then with the European community, it had to de-industrialize to some extent. And what made up that shortfall was tourism. You know, 80 million people coming to Spain. So a big part of the GDP here uh, is, you know, in tourism. And now with COVID, now that's why we have, we have close to 50% unemployment today with the youth. So as things open up, I think we're going to see uh, tourists come back here. But it's a similar sort of issue where we're relying in, you know, primarily on a lot of services and tourism. So, and, and I think tourism probably uh, has a lot of opportunity uh, in the African continent as well, in terms of, uh, of providing opportunities. But back to your point on education, if I remember in the Middle East, there was no way that anybody would take a course online before COVID. Today, everybody is doing stuff online. And I think if we're gonna be able to educate and train the African youth, it's gonna have to be online if we're gonna be able to scale this. Uh, I don't look, know if you want to add to that, Anish. Look, Anish? I mean, look, for sure. But the thing about, um, so we've seen this huge proliferation of, of MOOCs, massive open online courses. Coursera is, is obviously a very famous one. Udemy is another one. Um, in fact, how many of you taken, have taken Coursera or Udemy courses who, who are in this group? Is there a way of indicating whether people have taken? Yeah, maybe put your hand up if you've taken one. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It's become, many people are putting their hands up, right? So absolutely, online learning is, is I mean, I actually took one myself a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, it is a, it's an amazing resource that you can literally tap into Harvard and Yale and Stanford uh, um, lecturers and, and, and have a free, do a free course with them. It's just, it's a phenomenal opportunity. But what I would say is that in order to really benefit from online learning, you have to have reached a, let's say, basal level of educational understanding. You need to know how to, you need to have learned how to learn, right? I don't, right. I think online learning is super useful for people who already have a, a decent level of education to start with. But the problem in Africa is that getting to that decent level of basic education, I'm talking about numeracy, critical thinking, problem solving. I'm talking about the kind of school, high school level of, of, of education. That is something I think many African nations lack. In fact, the OECD a few years ago did a global standardized testing. I think they probably looked at 80 countries uh, globally and they looked at 15 year olds and they gave them the exact same maths and science tests just to see what the, they tried to benchmark. And unfortunately, many um, African nations came right at the bottom of that list, including South Africa, which is, which is where I'm, li I'm living. Uh, South Africa, even though it's probably one of the most advanced um, economies on the continent, it has to. Ha it, it also has one of the worst education systems, not just in the continent but on in the world. Uh, and we're talking about this kind of you know secondary education. So I think that secondary education and primary education they need to be addressed to give you know kids and young people the basic maths knowledge and literacy knowledge so that then they're able to take advantage of Coursera and Udemy and educate themselves and learn how to code. I think that basal foundational level of education is something which unfortunately we haven't got yet, yet right in, in Africa. And it is so critical that that is addressed now because only once we do that, are we gonna be able to create a workforce that is able to participate in this global digital economy. And like I said, there's an opportunity here, right? There are many, You've probably heard about these digital nomads now, post COVID. All these guys are living in Costa Rica. They're working for Facebook and Amazon and Google, but they're sitting in Costa Rica, living in a shack on the beach, earning $200,000 a year, but like, you know, sitting on the beach, right? It, it, it's actually amazing. COVID has demonstrated to us that we're able to work pretty much anywhere. Not all jobs, obviously, but many of the digital jobs in particular, the ones where the, the, there's lots of opportunity, you can work anywhere. And so what that means is such a huge opportunity for us. African developers can work for, you know, Chinese startups or um, American startups, right? It effectively increases the addressable pool of, of job opportunities. But of course, you're competing with Indian programmers and Filipino programmers as well. But the point is, you're no longer bound by geography. 
the only thing that's limiting you is your ability to code or your ability to do data, data analytics. And that's why the education piece, I think, is critical. If we can crack the education piece, you're going to see a lot more entrepreneurs. You're going to see a lot more people working. And the more and more people are, are working and getting experience, that is what catalyzes entrepreneurship. You look at Silicon Valley, for instance, right? Companies like Apple and Facebook and Google, they form effectively anchor companies that breed entrepreneurs. People will go to Google, they'll do a stint there, they'll come up with their own idea, then they'll launch their startup. And that will turn out to be a billion dollar startup. So you need these anchor types of, of, um, of companies that help to breed additional entrepreneurs. And this is something that we've never been able to get right uh, so far in Africa. Yeah, but I, I think you're right that the basic foundational skills are necessary here. Maybe Santiago, you know, I know you've written a lot about critical thinking and you know how important it is in the humanities and part of any education. What do you think about this discussion here in terms of providing the youth in Africa with these, these skills? Thanks very much, uh, Paris, for that uh, cold calling, eh, as we do in, in, in normal classes, many of you know. But uh, you are pointing at something which is very much at the core of IE University, which is uh, developing not just uh, the best uh, employable graduates that may jump you know, directly into uh, jobs in, in many companies represented here. And some of you are alumni of IE already uh, running your own ventures or maybe working for companies like Telefonica, like as Rafael. No? So we're not just aim at uh, training the best employable uh, graduates, but also committed citizens who aim at transforming the world for the better. And this is very much in the spirit of conveying, you know, these, uh, uh, these teachings and these courses in the humanities. The idea uh, behind this is uh, bringing the best of the two worlds of education. Many of you are familiar with the liberal arts curriculum, which is prevalent in the US and in the UK, which produces very good entrepreneurs. If I ask you, which of the two uh, regions produces more entrepreneurs, Europe or the US? Uh, I guess the, the, the response is, is evident. And probably it has to do also with this combination of liberal arts tradition, conveying the humanities and training graduates also to become committed citizens, as well as, of course, preparing them to be competent uh, in their future jobs. So this is the spirit that, that is behind, you know, uh, this uh, emphasis on the humanities that we uh, make at, at IE University and of course Africa, going to, to your question Paris, is a very rich con continent in terms of um, history, in terms of the arts, in terms of literature and in terms of tradition. And uh, one of the aims of the IE Africa Center, for example, and Felicia may illustrate this uh, much further, is actually to spread the knowledge on all those uh, marvels of Africa that uh, the rest of the world uh, don't know. Uh, this is why we are pushing ahead to this program, Gurus and Grayos, so that our students at IE University learn more about uh, Africa. So lots of things to do, but uh, what I'm very confident is that having, you know, this uh, wonderful panel of uh, students and uh, alumni and friends of IE, we are actually going to transform the world for the better. Thanks very much, Paris. Thank you, Santiago. All right, let's move along with our next panelist. And don't forget that everyone's going to get a chance to ask some questions of everybody at the end. Miss Barry, how are you today? I'm good, Paris. How are you? Thanks for having I'm good. me. Good. No, it's a pleasure. Uh, we're going to go on to a subject that's probably a lot more fun, Miss Barry, uh, which is the whole <laughs> PR industry and the role of influencers. So are there influencers in Africa as well? And what role do they play? There are many influencers. And it's, it's so funny how there's been such a shift in the way we've been used to doing PR. By the way, you might think it's fun, but trust me, I had a horrible morning. This is, my, this is a much needed break. It is uh, same as everything else. You know, there's fun and the less fun. Um, the influencers, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think it comes as part of that big global PR shift that we've been experiencing the past 10 years. Um, the way we used to do communications and PR traditionally has nothing to do with the way we do PR right now. And, 
and it is the same in Africa, there's been such a, a huge digital shift that we now have a much bigger spectrum and much more platforms to actually feed and so many more audiences that we used to have. So influencers are very important on the continent. We don't run a single communications campaign now without having to actually contact influencers, which has been interesting, interesting for us in our relationship with the journalists. So not only did they have to shift the way they work, work at, at a much faster pace than they used to, um, you know, Khaled really um, explained that really well at the beginning during his keynote. Um, historically, the lack of industries in Africa was translated in the way journalists had to report. So a typical journalist in an African country outside of South Africa, because it's very specific, and also Kenya, would have to, you know, cover stories that were very political. Um, and then all of a sudden, they had to understand fintech, agribusiness, um, public health, but in a very technical way. And so we had to basically accompany this shift and also so still, you know, creating value for them, training them as we still learn also as a PR industry. Uh, making sure they were sort of up to up to speed to report and to, to do the to do their work properly, and then having this pool of influencers commenting on current affairs at a really really fast pace. Um, so this has been interesting to watch and to witness um, that shift of relationship and that sh that shift in the way in the way we do work basically. Okay, and, and what do you see as, how do you think, the, what does the future hold for the PR and advertising industry in Africa? So, you know, I like to tell that story that, um, and it comes back to creating jobs, it comes back to the continent growing. Um, when I started, when I decided to actually start working more with the continent, it was 15 years ago, I left my company in London. And so my boss at the time sent an email, you know, announcing that I was leaving and just didn't give too, too many details, but just said that I was starting a venture in Africa and, and so on. A day later, I'm fixing myself a cup of tea. I've got a colleague in the kitchen who tells me, oh, I've seen that you're leaving. We're gonna miss you. But really, you should be so proud. I heard that you're going to go work for a charity in Africa. So this was 15 years ago. The perception of somebody working in Africa had to be aid driven or had to be something to do with the charity. So I remember posing and thinking, OK, that's going to be interesting. Uh, first of all, it's PR. You know, nobody really cares about PR. Second is PR in Africa. This is going to be a long journey things have changed so things look a lot better and i think thanks to the number of startups that are being created you know it allows room for more creativity and and really bettering the african narrative so i think there's there's tons of hope in on this and there's also an understanding a global understanding that communications and pr play a huge role um in advocacy and in and in and in sort of pushing um, pushing certain societal changes and ideas and and you know maybe maybe the the hope for a better world basically. So just to illustrate on this, um, I've kept this. It's like a, it's a few few weeks old, uh, but this this is the New York Times magazine, and this was the health issue. And basically, the reason why I want to mention that is because um, this particular issue is looking at how, over the past century, our, um, the humanity, um, basically, our lifespan doubled. So it's looking at the reasons why it doubled. So obviously, the, you know, the, 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 the easy answer would be, well, it's scientific advancement, you know, like science helped. Yes, it did. But with that activism and act advocacy, we would have never doubled our life expectancy. So it sort of validates the importance of communications and PR. 
um, in the role that it plays in advancing any initiative, basically. Um, and I think, you know, if we think about the hope and what's what's looking, what it is looking like for us in our industry at the moment in 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 the continent and also globally, I think in the past PR and communications was probably something nice to have, and now we really have a seat at the CEO table. You know, communications is about reputation management. It's about where the priorities should be. It's about being part of that global social conversations where we allow and we help or we are at the root i believe of understanding um that we need to be aware of culture of gender of culture cultural differences and sort of guide through these changes um so there's tons of work still that needs to be done on the continent um i think that we're still lacking data um, as we've been, you know, talking about, I think the emergence of AI make our job a little easier. Um, but I would like to see, um, yeah, what what we've got, what things would look like in ten years would be very different as we build this sort of communications infrastructure and and sort of PR infrastructure and get more equipped to 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 guide these transformations. Thank you, Barry. You know, I totally agree with uh, Miss Barry. Thank you, Eloine. Um, sure. I totally agree with you with the message of communication. I spend a lot of time with big companies and it's, a, it's amazing how communication has become like the main conversation at the table today. Yeah. And, and I think it has to do with everything that's going on with sustainability, inclusion. These are no longer, you know, values that people had and said, well, this is one of the several values that we've got they become front and center for a lot of companies. And, and also and it's the became... crisis starts so easily. I mean, you can start a crisis within, by just you know, tweeting something at a particular company. So yeah. if you don't have um, a communications team present to handle that or to get ready for this to happen, it can really create a huge, um, a huge, huge issue. Right, and I also noticed what you said you know, when, I, when I started IE about 11 years ago, all the African startups were very much about either nonprofit or charities or some, some effort to give back and to help. Then they became, you know, over the last three years, even before, before COVID especially, everything started to change. It was about scalability, opportunity, making money. And now post COVID, you see this really interesting mix of scalability and money with impact. Yeah. And doing good, which is it's a great, it's, it's, yeah, it's, especially the impact. So it's a great transition. So uh, this is a great time to bring you to the table. Um, and as one of the many uh, people at IE that traveled the world a lot, uh, as we spread the word um, about our way of, of educating, we're always running into students that are coming back to their countries that have figured out that the best place to actually develop your future professionally is your own country because it's where you feel at home. Um, talk to me about the diaspora, you know, the African diaspora. And are, are these people coming back? Do we see skills coming back to Africa? Well, yes. So thank you so much for this platform and the discussion has been riveting so far. So I'm really excited to contribute what I know as well. Um, to answer your question, Paris, very simply, yes. And I am one, one such student who finished living in Europe and decided to move to Ghana. And I don't see myself leaving for any reason because there is so much opportunity to, like you said, um, make an impact and also um, scalability and also profitability of just being here and creating solutions or collaborating to create solutions. Um, there's so many advantages to being here, which is why you, you've seen that, that shift and that scale. And one of the things that um, has happened over the last maybe four or five years is the, the I, I like to call them the push and pull factors. Um, so geopolitics globally was quite um, a, a, pu a push factor for people from the West to, to Africa, especially if you have an identity, an African identity, those of us that did have, um, were connected to African identities 
saw that at this period as, as a time to really engage it. And so the diaspora at this point, after see after geopolitics really being uh, identity politics really playing a role in discouraging them from where they were being so settled and where they were living, um, decided to engage the other identities. And that for in Ghana, for example, we saw a lot of Ghanaians say, okay, um, with Brexit and with um, politics in the U.S. not looking favorable for for different demographics of people, let me explore what it means to 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 come back to where 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 I, where it's supposed to be my home, um, and so th th those have been the pull factors. But also, like we we're just talking about social media, um, the impact of social media in connecting the world and making a, a fellow a fellow entrepreneur in Ghana or a fellow um, lawyer or something in Ghana very much more accessible than they were ten years ago makes people understand the terrain better and also feel like they can contribute something to it. Um, then there's also, we can't underplay the concerted efforts by governments. I mean, every in these last few years, Ghana, for example, has made a concerted effort to engage our diaspora. And that has those policies that have been put in place. I mean, we all know of the year of return. I don't think anyone here <laughs> did not hear about it. Um, just that effort to dedicate a year to welcoming the diaspora back home was such a concerted effort and such a well-received efforts for people who are already looking for connection. And so with all those different factors at play, I think this is, was such an opportune moment, still is an opportune moment to, for the diaspora to come and get, get connected here. But on a personal note, I think, um, like you say, coming home, the, I, 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 like to, I like to tell people, especially my, my colleagues who asked me why I, was, why I was leaving London to come back to Ghana, I, I, I simply told them that this is the part of the world where my ceiling is the highest or non-existent and that is that is a, the, the case for a lot a lot of people who see themselves and their skills as being able to have a greater impact in a shorter amount of time on the on on the on the country and on the continent yeah no no i think that's that's so true um i i recently you may know jake that uh ghana controls much of the taxi service in washington dc Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was recently there, and uh, I, I don't mean Ghana, the country, but Ghana people, right? Um, and I was recently there uh, last year, and a there was this Ghana driver, the taxi, and so I asked him how, what was life like? What was he happy? And he said, "Yeah, life's not bad, but you know what?" He said, "For the same amount of money, or a little bit, you know, less, I would rather be in my country, because when you're in your country." You know, you're, you're at home and, and you're giving back. And so he said to me very clearly, you know, I have a plan. I'm going to save enough money and then I'm going to go back to my country and make an impact. And, and there's so many people like that, that I think we need to attract, whether they're professionals or people that just want to go back and make a difference. And I think we've seen so much more of that post COVID where, you know, people are looking for much more meaning in their lives and back to the identity, you know, uh, politics and all that. It's part of who you are. But you know, there's, there's, there's that. So now I, you find that the diaspora is not coming back just to make a, just to give back. The, the language around giving back has, has changed significantly. They are coming to collaborate with people on the ground who are already doing significantly amazing things and coming to lend their skills to wider development. It's, it's it, I think gone are the, the days where people with, the, the give back narrative has shifted significantly. And so now people, people want to find, find people on the ground who understand the terrain and bring their, their insights or their expertise or their, even their funding to prop up and to contribute to what is already happening on the ground. So we, we, we like to say, it's not that Ghana is waiting for its diaspora, but, but the country and the, and the continent at large cannot fully live, grow to its potential with, with just a portion of its, uh, of its human capital uh, away. And there's so many ways to contribute. It's not just about moving back to Ghana. I mean, look, we're doing something virtually. I'm basically in Spain right now, but I'm sitting here in Accra. Um, there's yeah. ways in which Ghanaians are connecting back to Ghana 
via, via the internet, via online businesses, and via working from home, because now, because people are working from home, they have, they have the flexibility to do a few more interesting things. And even what I have found in, during COVID, which was, I mean, I hate to say there was a benefit of the pandemic, but so many people were, have been able to stay in Ghana for longer. I've, I, know, I know people who, who came to Ghana in October, November, December last year that are still here working from home and actually engaging with, 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 the, with, the, with the country in a way that they, they know that they're, they're basically one foot out of where they are and moving back here. And there's, there are even some people who will go back, but now ha have a better lived experience of, 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 the, of the country as it is and will continue to make significant deposits into what we are doing here. Yeah, no, no, you're totally right. By giving back, I mean, that new narrative, which is not going back to do a nonprofit, but to, if you're going to contribute to the progress of a society, to give back in your own society, you know, yeah. to be part of that growth to, uh, you know, and, and that's the beauty of the, this new giving back narrative, I think. Okay. Uh, well, I think this brings to an end the actual discussions directly with the panelists, but now we've got time for Q&A. So this is an amazing opportunity, everybody. Um, just uh, let's see, where do we have the questions? Wow, like I, I think we've got- We have the questions uh, in the chat. Yeah, we got the questions in the chat here. Uh, let's begin. All right. All right, so this is uh, Ephraim. I want to know by what means the informal sector and trade union can contribute to Africa's employment. Who wants to have a shot at that? I can have a crack at that if you want. All right, Anish. I mean, the reality is that the, most people who work in Africa are working in the informal sector. Um, um, and that is both, well, there's positives and negatives to it, right? Um, you know, the informal sector you know, selling fruit on the streets or, or, or whatever. Um, I guess it's necessary because it is also a kind of entrepreneurship, the informal sector, people hustle, right? I mean, you've got to work, you've got to earn money, you've got to hustle. Um, the problem with the informal sector, of course, is that, you know, wages are very low. Um, employee protection is, is basically not there. Um, and and uh, there's no tax revenue that governments can collect from, from the informal sector. So, I don't think it's possible for Africa to really develop um, unless we move from the informal sector to the formal sector, to the formal economy. I think it's only when you get into the formal economy that you can start doing proper metrics, proper measurements, proper policy, um, that you can start um, generating fiscal revenue from that industry and, and you know, really drive it in, driving targeted initiatives. So, you know, the informal sector, I guess, is what it is. But if we have high aspirations for Africa, we need to start thinking about how do we move from informal to formal. Trade unions, I guess this is a kind of separate point. And look, I mean, I live in, in South Africa where we have very, very rigid labor laws. I don't know. Uh, I think different, uh, different nations in Africa have slightly different perspectives. But I feel that many African countries has ex have extremely rigid labor laws. Uh, in, Af in South Africa, for instance, it's extremely difficult to, to fire somebody. And because of that, a lot of companies don't like to hire people in the first place because they know that if they're going to have to get rid of them, then it's going to be a very painful and, and costly process. So I would say, you know, unionism is very counterintuitive. It's a very socialist, um, communist and inspired ideal, which I think is actually very, uh, has a, it's having a very negative effect. On, on, on the growth of the labor market and economic growth in general. So my view is that we need to move away from informal to formal. And as far as possible, we need to make labor laws much more flexible. And that those two things in turn will actually help to catalyze economic growth and, and, and increase employment. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think labor unions have a chance when they have power, but they don't have power now because we need more people employed. Hey, trust me, in South Africa, they're extremely powerful. And um, I think one of the reasons why the unemployment rate in South Africa is amongst the highest in the world is because of the bargaining council setting very high minimum wages, uh, uh, which effectively reduces the number of people being hired. Um, 
so, so yeah, I mean, look, you know, I understand it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you want to protect your labor force. On the other hand, you want to grow your economy, right? Which one's more important? Because my view is that you've got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, right? If you really want to grow your economy, make your labor, labor force more, more flexible. That in turn will encourage people to hire more. more. Uh, entrepreneurs will be able to hire more. So I think that it's very short-sighted that, um, you know, unions, at least in South Africa, are very powerful. Um, I think it's a lot of it is legacy. I mean, look, the African National Congress has got very strong ties with, you know, communism. In fact, there is still a large communist party element or communist influence um, in the African National Congress. So you got to kind of, <laughs> we, we need to kind of move to a bit more of a progressive, uh, you know, economic um, ideology, I think, of Africa. Unfortunately, you know, obviously, de decolonization is fairly recent. It's in the last 50 to 70 years. And, you know, there is this kind of people are sticking up the finger to the Europe, European colonial masters saying, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with, with you. We want to go the Chinese way. We want to kind of embrace that kind of autocratic type of, of vibe, right? And I think that whilst there may be some merit in doing so, I think that at the end of the day, if you want to grow your economy, you need to think in a bit more capitalist, a bit more progressive way. So I'm ranting about this kind of thing. I can talk for hours about it. But anyway, that, that's my perspective. Uh, I'm keen to hear if anyone else has a different view. No, I, I love your perspective, Anish. So uh, building on what you just said, there's a question here regarding what solutions do you propose, everybody, to combat authoritarian regimes and corruption? There are major, these are major factors hindering sustainable development on the continent. That's probably the million dollar question, right? Um, if, if I could comment on that one, um, I always say to people that I don't think that the biggest problem in Africa is corruption. Because, what? Because corruption, you, it's in the scale in Africa, you can actually see something similar in other parts of the world. What I think is the biggest problem in Africa is actually they don't understand the value of actually doing the work they needed to do. Because corruption, there's, there's different types of corruption. People can actually have a stake in a business and actually at the same time help that business grow bigger. In that way, some will call it baking a bigger pie. In my own opinion, I think we have wasted too much resources trying to fight corruption. As a Nigerian politician will say, you don't lock up your shop and fight corruption. What you do is that you have to get business going and start to put in the right policies and the right training, like what IE is doing, to actually change the situation. If we all stop and say, let's fight corruption, that Africa will never move forward. What you do is that you start to encourage good businesses, younger policies that actually will come and drive different ideology, in my own opinion. I, when people talk about corruption, I said, yes, it's a big problem that should actually be attacked. But the best way to attack corruption is to make sure that those businesses that do the right thing actually get better funding, that have access to all the things that all those businesses that engage in very funny things can't actually get. That's my own personal view. Could I just respond to that, uh, Paris? Um, is that okay if I can respond to what Raphael just said? I okay, think I can't Paris might Paris. have gotten disconnected. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> man, Raphael, that's quite a, a, a controversial perspective there. I mean, um, I kind of disagree with you and agree with you. I think corruption is a massive problem, huge problem, right? If you think about the, you know, billions and billions of dollars, and we don't have that much money in Africa to start off with, right? But if you think about the billions and billions that are stolen by uh, the political leadership, right? Um, that is a huge amount of capital that is not being um, spent correctly, right? All that money should be going back into the economy, being invested in infrastructure, being invested in, you know, rolling out broadband to everybody. Uh, you know, you're a telco guy, you understand this, this uh, more than anyone else, right? Um, th this money should be going into uh, investing in, in infrastructure and industrial development, but it's not. So I, I definitely disagree with you that corruption is not a problem. It's a massive problem. Where I agree with you is how do you solve it, right? Because you can't just lobby against corruption. That I think is a futile enterprise and it's never worked. What you can do is help to build the next generation of leaders 
who understand that you know stealing from the fiscus is a very short-term way of getting rich we need to take a long view and try and make the whole continent rich right and you have to do this by coming up with you know sensible policies by coming up with uh, a bit more structure and a bit more of a long-term vision in, in how you do things and i think that look if you think about it right the current generation of african leaders are still those who are you know from decolonization times many of them are still you know uh, nationalist freedom parties um many of them kind of are, you know were around in the kind of 60s and 70s and 80s when this decolonization was happening and i think that they've still got the colonial scars on their backs and they're still thinking we were oppressed so now it's our turn at the trough we want to take the money what i'm quite excited about is the new generation of people who were born post apartheid post post colonization post decolonization who really understand the importance of you know integrity and 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 who really have a vested interest in 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 the success of the economy so yeah i definitely agree building and grooming the next generation of african leaders is the only way we have to uh, overcome corruption and overcome a lot of the autocratic regimes that are are still you know um, causing a lot of problems in the continent okay uh praise i'm going to give the floor back to you i think we're just at the uh, mark when we were supposed to end this uh, panel. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much, panelists. But um, Robert would um, help us with the transition to um, our poet. Very good. Very, uh, let's say, exciting and uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, interesting topic there up for debate. So thank you so very much. Uh, to all of our panelists. Um, yes, at this time, we would like to treat everybody um, to a quick break. Uh, we're going to take about 15 minutes, refill your coffee, grab a tea. Uh, and while we do that, uh, we're going to uh, enjoy the treat of a very short poetry extract um, from the South African creative artist, uh, Kefense Dlavini, uh, who is going to share with us uh, some words of poetry. Hi, can anyone see me? Hello? Yes, we can see you. Hi, yes. can you hear me? Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't see anyone. Hi, my name is Gefenza Tlamini. I am definitely an artist and I'm here to read a poem by Binya Vanga Wainaina. He is an African po poet who dissects African cliches and how people write and the Western write about Africa. So yes, I'll be sharing a short poem by Binya Vanga Wainaina. Please enjoy. How to Write About Africa by Binya Vanga Wainaina. Always use the word Africa or darkness or safari in your title. Subtitles may include words like Zanzibar, Messiah, Zulu, Zambezi, Congo, Nile, Big Sky, Shadow, Drum, Sun or Bigan. Always use, also use useful words such as gorillas and timeless and tribal. Note that people means Africans who are not black while the people means black Africans. Never ever have a well-adjusted African on your cover of your book or in it, unless that African has won a Nobel Peace Prize or he has an AK-47 prominent ribs, naked breasts, use this. If you must include an African, make sure you get one in a Maasai or Zulu or Dongan dress. In your text, treat Africa as if it was one country. I mean, it is hot and dusty with rolling grasslands and huge herds of animals and tall and thin people who are starving. Or is it hot and steamy with very short people who eat primates? Don't get bogged down with precise descriptions like Africa is big with 54 countries and 900 million people who are too busy starving and dying and warring and immigrating to read your book. The continent is full of deserts and jungles and highlands and savannas and many other things, but your reader doesn't care about all of that. So keep the descriptions romantic, evocative and unparticular. Make sure you show how Africans have music and rhythm and deep in their souls and they eat things no other humans eat. Do not mention rice or beef or wheat, but monkey brain, 
is an African cuisine of choice, along with goat and snake and worms and grubs and all the manner of game meats. Make sure that you are able to eat such food without flinching and describe how you would learn to enjoy it because, I mean, you care. Taboo subjects, ordinary domestic scenes, love between Africans, refer references to African writers or intellectuals, or mention of school children going who are suffering from yours or Ebola fever or female genita genital mutilation. Throughout the book, adopt a Soto voice in conspiracy with the reader and a sad, I expected so much tone. Establish early that your liberalism is impeccable and mention near beginning how much you love Africa and how you fell in love with the place and you can't live without her. I mean, Africa is the only continent you can love. So take advantage of this. If you are a man, thrust yourself into her warm virgin forests. If you're a woman, treat Africa as a man who wears a bush jacket that disappears off into the sunset. I mean, Africa is to either be pitied worshipped or dominated. Whichever angle you take, be sure to leave the strong African impression that without your intervention and your important book, Africa is doomed. Your African characters, however, may include naked warriors, loyal servants, diviners and seers and ancient wise men living in hermetic splendor or corrupt politicians in ep polygamous travel guides and prostitutes that you have slept with. The loyal servants always behave like a seven-year-old and he needs a firm hand. He's scared of snakes, good with children and always involving you in his complex domestic dramas. The ancient wise man always comes from a noble tribe, not the money-grabbing type tribes like Kiyuki or the Igbu or the Shona. He, however, has roomy eyes and he's so close to the earth. The modern African man is a fat man who steals and works in the visa office, refusing to give work permits to qualified Westerners, pragmatic who really care about Africa. He's an enemy of development, always using government jobs to make it difficult for pragmatic, good-hearted expats to set up NGOs or legal conservation areas, or he is an Oxford educated intellectual turned into serial killing politician in a style rose suit. He is a cannibal who likes crystal champagne and his mother is a rich witch doctor which really runs the country. Among your characters always include the starving Africa. That's the one, the starving African who wanders the refugee camp nearly naked, waits for the benevolence of the West her children have flies on their eyelids and port bellies and her breasts are flat and empty. She must look utterly helpless. She can have no past, no history. Such diversions ruin the dramatic moment. Moans are good, but she must never say anything about herself in the dialogue. Expect to speak of her while being, just, just call her mama. Always be sure to include a warm and motherly woman who has a rolling laugh and who is concerned for your well-being. Her children, however, are all delinquent. Feed them, feed them. These characters should buzz around your main hero, making him look good. Your hero can teach them how to bathe, how to feed, and he carries a lot of babies and he's seen death. Your hero is you a beautiful, tragic, international celebrity who now cares for animals. You know, that's if it's fiction. Bad Westerners may include children of Tory cabinet ministers or Afrikaners or employees of the World Bank. When talking about exploitation by foreigners and mention the Chinese and Indian trades, blame the Western for African situation, but don't be too specific. Dis Broad brush strokes throughout a good. Avoid having the African characters laugh or struggle to educate their kids or just do mundane circumstances. Have them illuminate something about Europe or America in Africa. African characters should be colorful, exotic, larger than life, but empty inside with no dialogue, no conflicts or resolutions in their stories or no depth or quirks to confuse the cause. Described in detail, naked breasts, young, old, 
conservative, recently raped, big, small, or mutilated genitals, or enhanced genitals, or any kind of genitals, and dead bodies, or better, better yet, naked dead bodies, and especially rotting naked dead bodies. Remember, any work you submit in which people look filthy and miserable will be referred to as the real Africa. And that, that's what you want on your dust jacket. Do not feel queasy about this because you are trying to get help for them to get aid from the West. The biggest taboo in writing about Africa is to describe or show how dead or suffering white people are. Animals, on the other hand, must be treated as well-rounded, complex characters. They speak, have names, ambitions, and desires. They also have family values. See how lions teach their children. Elephants are caring and are good feminists as dignified patriarchs. So are gorillas. Never ever say anything negative about an elephant or a gorilla. Elephants may attack people's property, destroy their crops, or even kill them, but always take the side of the elephant. Big cats have public school accents, hyenas are fair game and have vaguely Middle Eastern accents and any short Africans who live in the jungle or desert may be portrayed with good humor unless they are in conflict with an elephant, a chimpanzee or a gorilla in which, in case, they're pure evil. After celebrities, activists and aid workers and conservationists, Africa's most important people do not offend them. You need to invite them into the 30,000 acre game ranch or conservation area. And this is the only way you will get to interview the celebrity activist. Often a book cover with a heroic looking con con conservationist on works of magic for sales. Anybody white tanned wearing khaki who once had a pink antelope or a farm or is a conservationist or one who is preserving Africa's rich heritage, that's him. When interviewing him or her, do not ask how much funding they have. Do not ask how much money they make of their game. Never ask how much they pay their employees. Readers will be put off if you don't mention the light in Africa and the sunset. The African sunset is a must. It is always big and red. There is always a big sky, wide empty spaces and game are critical. Africa is the land of wide empty spaces. When writing about the plight of flora and fauna, make sure that Africa's all overpopulated when your main character is in a desert or jungle living with indigenous people, anybody short, it is okay to mention that Africa's severely depopulated by AIDS and war. Make sure to use caps when writing that. You will also need a nightclub called Tropicana where the evil, rich Africans and prostitutes and gorillas experts hang out. But on a lighter note, always end your book with Nelson Mandela saying something about rainbows or renaissances because you care, don't you? Thank you. Thank you. That's all. That was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Wow, Kefensi, thank you so much for those beautiful and thoughts provoking words for our <laughs> poetry break. I think we will now continue with just five more minutes uh, of a quick break and then right at uh, 5 30. Uh, Spain time, we will get going with our second panel.
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, following our very engaging and exciting panel on technology, digitalization, uh, and entrepreneurship, it's time to uh, shift gears. Uh, and for our next panel, we will be discussing uh, themes related to sustainable development. Uh, this panel will be focusing on, you know, the three panels of sustainability, uh, the economic, social, and environmental pillars. Uh, for this panel, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Claude Grunitsky, who is the CEO of the Equity Alliance. Uh, and he is also the founder of Trace TV and True Africa. We also have uh, Busiswe Mabuso, who is the CEO at Business Leadership South Africa, along with Josiane uh, Yagibu, who is the country representative of the United Nations Population Fund in Togo. Uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce uh, IE Professor Grace Obado, who is a professor in our School of Global and Public Affairs. Uh, just a kind reminder, this panel will last until uh, 6.15 or quarter after six Madrid time, and at which point I'm going to ask uh, Mohammed. Uh, one of our IE Foundation Kistefo scholars and Africa Club member, uh, if he may help us, uh, let's say, with organizing the questions from the chat for our moderator, Grace. So, uh, Grace, I turn it over to you. Thank you uh, very much, Robert, for uh, the kind introduction. Sustainable development is an important uh, topic for Africa in this century more than in the previous ones. And it's important to take into account, first of all, the definition of sustainable development. And so if we use grow Brutland's definition of, of sustainability, which was coined in 1987, is basically meeting our needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Now, if we look at Africa today, millions of Africans still live uh, below the poverty line, which means with less than $2 per day. And we also know that poverty is the most important social dimension of sustainable de development. Can we really achieve sustainable development if uh, millions of Africans are still poor? 
African, the, uh, um, in today's Africa, sustainability is taken very seriously to an extent that the African Union together with the United Nations and the World Bank have set up an office in Kigali that monitors how various African countries are doing in terms of achieving sustainable development goals. And periodically they publish reports on, on, on what needs to be done or what has been achieved. Well, when we look at that report, there's reason for optimism because we see countries, particularly in North Africa, that they seem to be doing well on almost, uh, or on a number of the 17 sustainable development goals. In their last report, the one of 2020, Tunisia leads that list and as actually replaced Mauritius that uh, was the top ranking countries um, uh, uh, previously or in the previous years. But if we zoom into specific um, SDGs, we see that uh, good health and well-being, for example, is one of the areas where Africa is really still lagging behind. And that also pretty much applies to a large extent to education. So, uh, and you know, and but the areas where Africa is also doing good, which is worth noting, is on climate action. And this is no coincidence, I would argue, because Africans and African leaders know that Africa together with Latin America will be the worst impacted areas by climate change. And so with me, uh, as you know, we have our panelists um, um, uh, that are experts and, and are doing uh, incredible work on the continent and also, I mean, for the continent from the diaspora to discuss these issues. So I will not uh, uh, go into greater details uh, because some of these uh, achievements will come out in our discussion. So I would like to, um, my first question is actually for um, uh, Claude uh, Grunitsky. And so Claude, um, as he was introduced, you know, he's the CEO of Equity Alliance and founder of Trace and, and, and True Africa. And my question to him is that as we strive to achieve a prosperous and a more inclusive Africa, it's also important to note that uh, most of that success lies on the back of Africa's youth, which forms 50% or over 50% of uh, the population. So that requires, that, de that demands of us also to reimagine um, opportunities for them and mostly to reimagine the landscape of education. Education that can allow them to build institutions that we very much need, but institutions that also mirror the needs of Africans an education that can allow them to address infrastructure problems uh, that we uh, talked about before, health problems, and most importantly, to, that can turn them into job creators rather than job seekers. So uh, my question to you is, uh, from where you stand, what is this, what is being done? And are we doing enough to uh, try and bridge the huge gap that we have on the continent in education? Uh, well, first I'll thank you very much, Grace, for the question. Thank you, Praise, for inviting me as a speaker. And thank you to all the wonderful panelists that I'm meeting here on Zoom. If I'm gonna jump straight into the answer and be really honest about this, we would have to agree as Africans, and me, I'm speaking as a native son of Togo, that the answer is no, we are not doing enough. And you know, a lot of people are talking a lot about a lot of things, but they're not actually doing what should be done on the ground and for the real people. And I start with the perspective of somebody who's been an entrepreneur my whole adult life. And I focus my entire career on narratives that are about promoting a better image of Africa and of black people in general. And, and, and the truth is, if we look at where we are now, you know, uh, you spoke about the youth um, 60 percent of the population in Africa is under the age of 25, but I believe that Africa is missing an opportunity to tap into its young talent. And, and that's because the governments have, have failed 
the youth, you know, and Africa remains the poorest continent. You know, if we think of the fact that by the year 2050, there's going to be more, um, there's going to be more than 1.2 billion young people in Africa. And Nigeria is, you know, uh, currently 200 million people, but it's soon at the end of the century, it's going to be uh, over a billion people in Nigeria alone. We now have to find actionable ways to nurture Africa's talent. And this is becoming really, really urgent. And that's why, you know, somebody like me, I mean, I've spent a lot of energy into creating media ventures to promote education through media for the youth. But now I'm going one step further because I'm creating um, a university, an online university that will hopefully become a Pan-African learning community that will really focus on accelerating Africa's sustainable development. And, and, and the way that I believe that we should work together um, based on what you said, Grace, about the sustainable development goals is to maybe pick one of these seven SDGs and, and, and do what we can do. You, I believe you, no one can be an expert at everything. And, and so I picked SDG number four, which is quality education. And I'm insisting on the world, world, world quality because the reality is a lot of the education on the continent that I see is not education for employment or education for entrepreneurship. It's very theoretical education, it's dated education, and it's not actually addressing some of the real problems that our youth and that our populations are facing on the continent. And that's why I believe that these conferences and these events, even if they're virtual on Zoom, they're really important because they will allow us to mobilize a global network of, of partners, whether they're academic partners, government partners, industrial partners, institutional partners. I believe that these kinds of dialogues and conversations that we're having now are meant to foster um, what I will call transcultural collaborations. Yeah, thank you very much for that, uh, Claude. While, you know, when talking about the, so we talking about innovation in, in education in order to increase also access um, uh, of Africans to quality education, right? Uh, but one of the challenges that Africa is st still dealing with in this sense is also, it has to do with also the environment. Education does not happen in a vacuum, does it? So where students learn also matter. And so uh, if we look at many children going to school in rural Africa, uh, some children are lucky to learn under tree and some the tree has been cut so there's no tree even to, 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 to learn under. What do you think, which holistic approach or from your experience, uh, can you share with us where we also take into account not just the content, not just you know giving people access, but also giving them the right tools and taking care of also of the spaces where they learn? I think that um, the approach to quality education, again, that SDG number four, which is one that I'm focusing on and a lot of my partners are focusing on, is really about thinking through new ways to change the curricula. You know, a lot of these curricula are very much based on Western problematics, you know, issues that are related to the Western world, to Europe, to America, and they're not really focused on what's actually needed for the growth of our economies and for the cohesion of our African societies. And one of the things that I believe we need to do a better job of implementing on the ground is to find ways to nurture student-centric approaches um, that will uh, you know, help to acquire actually practical and higher level skills, as opposed to thinking that students always have to be passive in the classroom and that you know, they should not speak up. I believe that we need to look at the insights that we can gather from our collective experiences on the ground and help students to master the complexity of the world that we're living in now. Post pandemic, this is gonna become even more important for the youth because we're gonna to have to find ways to introduce mentors, to introduce peers, to introduce more project-based uh, in-person assignments that are about, okay, how do you solve and tackle this specific problems? You know, it, it, I, I often talk about issues related to the environment and climate change when I'm on the ground. And I'm the, that person who travels all over Africa all the time. And a lot of the young people that I speak with, they don't even know that there's climate change issues in Africa. 
you know, they believe that it's something that white people keep talking about, but it doesn't really affect us. And that's why I decided to uh, partner with people and, 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 and make a film about the environment, you know, which, uh, you know, I'm very proud of because we've been winning all these awards with our film, The Great Green Wall, because we really are growing a world wonder. And many Africans, older Africans and young Africans that I speak with, they don't know anything about the Great Green Wall. And this is an African-led movement that is really uh, already building an 8,000 kilometer wall of trees, a mosaic of trees across the entire width of Africa from Senegal all the way to Djibouti. And it's almost 15% underway and it's a massive project, but most Africans have never heard of the Great Green Wall. Why is that? And so I decided to create a feature film, a documentary about this in order to educate our young populations on issues related to conservation, climate change, biodiversity, and the importance of all of this in creating jobs for the future of Africa, as opposed to this very exploitative model that we've been in where companies uh, just come and, 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 and exploit Africa without actually giving anything back to the population or to its youth. Absolutely. I think that's an amazing project that I would only imagine that children across schools in Africa would be excited uh, uh, to, uh, to get involved with and to plant a tree. I planted a tree myself in my school uh, when I was growing up as part of the Green Belt Movement, which was Wangai Madhari's project. And it's one of the things that I am uh, proudest of. So uh, I hope many people will get to know about that and get involved. I'm so uh, glad you said that, Grace, because I just wanted to mentioned that Greenbelt is one of our partners in the Great Green Wall Project, and they've been uh, instrumental in, 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 in the messaging to raise awareness around these issues related to the importance of planting trees and so on. So I'm glad you did it yourself, and I'm glad you mentioned Greenbelt. And my tree still stands uh, uh, high and tall and strong, so in my, in my former school. Yes, so I think we can move to the next. Uh, I will we'll move to Ms. Uh, Josiane Yaguku. So my question to Ms. Jusiane Yagubu is um, resident representative of United Nations uh, Population Fund. And so one of when, I mean, in the West, um, one of the questions that everyone is asking is that, will Africa be able to manage the huge population? Uh, just you know, to give a few figures, the population now stands at 1.3 billion. It's going to double by mid this century. And by the turn of this century, there will be 4 billion Africans. And out of which half of them will be African women which means that 20% of the global population will be made up of African women. And so the question is really, uh, what are we doing enough to turn this huge opportunity of population growth into a demographic dividend? And what are we really doing regarding um, uh, reproductive health? I mean, if we look at sustainable development goals, where Africa is not performing very well, it's in health and well-being. So, I mean, if you could just give us a general picture of how, I mean, what is keeping Africa from um, achieving also um, sustainable development goal around health and well-being? Okay. Thank you so much, Grace, and um, thanks for having me on this panel. I, I apologize in advance for the quality of the picture. I tested it in advance, and once you know it, now it doesn't look good. So I'm delighted uh, to be part of this panel organized by IE Africa, uh, IE Africa Club in the context of the thought process that um, you're developing around creating a prosperous Africa. Special thanks to Praise um, for inviting and insisting that I be part of this, um, of this panel. She was one of our stellar um, young uh, intern, uh, which is part of the um, pillars that UNFPA uh, the United Nations Population Fund work uh, on leadership of young people and uh, um, uh, sexual and reproductive health of, um, of adolescent and young people. And this also gives me the opportunity to reconnect with uh, 
special people on this panel that I have that I have known for many uh, decades, but that, which doesn't speak to his age, but more speaks to his uh, um, to to uh, his, um, his his background and expertise. Uh, Claude, it's an it's an extreme pleasure to see you on this panel and uh, to be part of this discussion. Um, this uh, forum allows me to speak to some issues that are really critical and dear to my heart, uh, leaving no one behind, particularly in Africa, by accelerating education of young, of young African girls and adolescents, particularly in rural um, settings, to achieve a demographic dividend. So Grace, thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you for all the data that you've been given. One of the areas that UNFPA works on is also data and population um, and development. So I, I have to confess that a lot of the data that you gave is absolutely on dot and, uh, and, and, and correct. So I think you've asked many questions, but I think let me focus on two. I'm not sure how we're doing on time. Um, number one, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Number one, um, women, women leadership from the gender angle and achieving a sustainable development. So, as you, as you already stated very, very well and beautifully, gender equality is at the heart of the 2030 Sustainable Goal um, Agenda, which recognizes that um, achieving gender equality is a matter of human rights. And it's critical and it's crucial uh, to progress across the goals and targets. And um, I have to, to agree with um, some of the things that Claude said um, about um, the difference that we should and we have to make in Africa. And this is the role, this is the role of uh, some of some of the partners that uh, support African governments in at country level. Our work is really to make sure that um, human development is achieved at country level. But many of these inequalities, as you so well put it, so many of these inequalities um, around women in Africa have to do with health, have to do with social and cultural challenges. And some of the things that we are working with in, um, in, in, in West Africa and in Africa in general have to do with female genital mutilation, have to do with uh, some inequalities regarding child marriage, because um, uh, when marriage happens before the age of 16, the United Nations considers it as child marriage, not only forced marriage, but child marriage. And also some of the other areas, some of the other issues and challenges that compound the advancement of, uh, of women in Africa. So how does Afri Africa develop, make a sustainable development when half of its population, actually even more than half, because when you look at Togo, 52% of Togo population are, um, uh, represent, are, represent women. And in many of uh, our African countries, it's, um, the, the ratio is over, is over 50%. So how do we achieve uh, sustainable development when women do not decide or do not have the capacity to decide on their own health, on their own sexual, uh, sexual health, and when to get married, who to get married to, and also um, you know, what to do in terms of their body. And I really um, invite you to discover um, the latest report from UNFPA, which talks about my body, my choice, and which really focuses on all of these issues. The 2016 uh, Human Development Reports report indicates that African economies will benefit immensely of women's access to paid work, um, to paid work that is equal um, uh, to that of men. It estimates that the economic costs of gender gaps in the labor markets between 2010 and 2014 were nearly 95 billion annually in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. And that is equivalent to about 6% of GDP, which is um, almost twice the, the amount of the official development assistance that goes to the, uh, to the continent, and this is one of our uh, UN um, uh, sources. Therefore, uh, women in leadership and gender issues are critical to achieving um, a sustainable development. And in the UN, we monitor several of these um, indicators that are specific to, um, to, to, to gender equality 
and to, uh, to, to, to gender leadership, to women leadership. We have SDG 5, as you know it, I won't describe it, and we also have SDG 16, which has to do with governance, including women promotion and uh, at decisional uh, positions. So many countries, including Togo, uh, have inspired the world with uh, the recent focus on female leadership of, or women in decision positions. And in Togo, you may, you, you may, you may know or you may recall that in 2020, uh, the, recent, the, 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 the current government um, uh, nominated, nominated a, um, a, prime, a women prime minister and has a focus of male leadership, I mean, sorry, of female leadership, female leadership uh, in government including the Speaker of Parliament, um, which is also a woman, and a few other women in, in, in a substantive uh, position. But this is not enough. Nominating women in government might be uh, excellent, and they are doing a stellar job here in, in, in Togo, and we um, salute these efforts from government of Togo. However, we do believe that in all over Africa, more needs to be done, and we need to walk the talk of having women in government and impacting, transforming the, the lives of women and girls. Most countries have put in place specific policies and strategies aiming at achieving gender equality and equity at national level in line with the SDGs, um, but a lot remains to be done, particularly um, after this shadow pandemic has hit uh, the world uh, globally. Um, we there's an increase in income generation opportunities and equal pay that has to be critical to uh, achieving this. So I, I um, thought of, of a few aspects that needed to be accelerated in terms of gender, in gender equity and transforming their lives. Specific incentives to recruit women has to be in place uh, to increase capacity and provide career in development. Time saved in collecting and and carrying water because remember most of most of Africa is rural. In many countries, it, eighty percent of, of um, Africa um, of our um, um, of, um, of Africa is is is, um, is rural, and in uh, in some countries a little bit less. So more focus has to um, uh, be given or provided to collecting and carrying water, fuel, and uh, and forest products, and putting it to a better use. Uh, you know, um, as some of what um, um, some of the areas of Africa can focus on to improve uh, women leadership and contribute to accelerated um, to accelerated growth. So um, these are some of the issues that I, I started thinking about. But as you know, UNFPA um, focuses on three uh, on achieving three specific pillars, which is maternal mortality, um, uh, getting to zero maternal mortality, getting to zero um, gender based violence and getting uh, uh, to um, uh, accessibility of family planning products, all to improve uh, the lives of women and girls that we are working with. Now, Grace, back to the issue of the demographic dividend, which is one of the areas that UNFPA cover um, in terms of uh, accelerating economic growth at country level. Um, definitely, we do feel that um, uh, the demographic dividend um, is a, is, is, is a very special and, and uh, um, huge strategy that most African uh, countries that have um, um, a rapid economic, uh, that have a, a rapid demographic growth should really employ. Um, as you know, and you've said it already, 60%, um, 60% um, of, um, uh, of African population is currently um, uh, 60% of, uh, of, uh, of the, uh, how should I say that? Sorry about that. The 25 year, the under 25 uh, uh, population in Africa constitutes 60% of our population, which is huge, which is huge. So what are we doing about it? What are we really um, doing about it? And uh, we have, um, particularly in the Sahel countries, uh, which uh, have the most, um, the, the most rapid growth in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in population. Some of them have above 3% of, of rapid growth, which means that by 2030, the population would, would, have, would, would, have, 
which is in 10 years or nine years, which have exponentially uh, 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 risen. And uh, by 2063, which is the agenda of the Africa, of the um, uh, um, continental Africa we want, the Africa we want to, to, to have, would have doubled. And, in, and, and similarly, the population of um, the, the youth population um, uh, accordingly. So what is important to say? We need to make sure that African governments invest in youth, invest in health, invest in education that are focusing on young girls, because as you know, um, uh, education, for example, in, 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 in Togo, there is a parity in, in secondary um, education. So we have the same ratio of, of girls and, 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 and boys uh, enrolled in school. The ratio so, sort of decreases when it gets to the uh, above the secondary. So what are we doing to invest more and in making sure that girls are, are engaged in school? And as I said before, a lot of the factors are, are, are com a lot of the co uh, compounding factors regarding health and sexual health are really made, um, um, are really hindering their um, enrollment in school. So um, investing in youth is really the best, is really the best way to harness a demographic dividend and really the best to really uh, make sure that we achieve accelerated growth. Uh, just to give you an example, um, uh, currently in Africa, most African, uh, most African uh, society, um, families um, um, uh, are not able to, to, to feed their own, um, um, are not able to feed their families. When you look at, um, when you look at a cake that you are splitting in 10, when the, um, when the, the, the family is, has to split the cake in, in 10, as opposed to three, which is, the, the, um, which, is the, which is what we want to achieve, not only that we, we don't want to necessarily decrease the population, we want to be able to make sure that we harness the demographic dividend by having the family sizes that we want and that we're able to, uh, uh, we're able to provide education, we're able to provide health to uh, the number of, of, um, of uh, uh, kids that we're having. So this is what I want to share um, and really thank you for um, having me on this panel and um, over to you, Grace, thank you. Josiane, if you allow me, uh, I would like to ask you one more question. And this is around African girl child, um, African school children, especially girls during the pandemic that had to stay at home for long time periods. What has been, what has been the impact of that? What has been the impact of lockdowns on young African girls as far as education is concerned? As far as education is concerned, I will look at two important factors. Number one, um, gender-based violence has significantly increased um, in all over the world, but more specifically in Africa, uh, and and you know, as has also um, not has also not been a not a, not been addressed in in the right way. And so gender-based violence has increased. Uh, women and girls who were um, during the day um, and before the, the pandemic um, attending their own um, attending their own activities were now forced to be at face-to-face uh, -face with their own um, uh, assailer, uh, assailant. So number one, it has increased gender-based violence. It has, in, it, it, it has really um, it has also um, put, I mean, move, move backwards all of the, of, all of the, all of this, um, all of the gains that most countries have achieved in the past years. Number two, in terms of education, most countries, as you know, and I think one, some, someone in the first panel has, or has, has already, has also mentioned it, getting Africa to virtual and to, and to, fu and to function uh, with internet is a big challenge. Electricity is an issue. Uh, connection to internet is extremely expensive. So some of the things that we have developed within UNFPA 
is, is, is within your NFPA on a very small scale and it's not um, uh, large enough on a very small scale, is really to provide, with the help of some partners, to provide free internet to um, um, many centers uh, to uh, provide them with um, uh, schooling. But the government of Togo, which, which is the one um, that I work with, has also done a lot in terms of accelerating e-learning, in terms of accelerating schooling with UNICEF and, and, and for girls particularly. But I must say that after one and a half years of lockdown, of, of, of pandemic, everything has been, has, has been turned around. And the number of, um, of dropouts, the number of, uh, the number of, uh, of particularly girls uh, who have not returned to school is significant. So once this whole pandemic is over and we should not wait until it's over, uh, there will be a significant, um, um, uh, there will be a significant um, interest from the partners in investing in uh, girls and, and uh, boys going back to school. Thank you. Thank you very much for those insights, Josiane. I'll now move on to uh, Busisiwe Mabuso. Uh, Ms. Busisiwe Mabuso is the CEO of uh, Business Leadership in South Africa. And she is also an associate professor at uh, Witz University in Johannesburg. So, uh, when I mean we saw when when I saw your profile, a number of questions um, came to mind. So one of them is entrepreneurship is key to achieving development in Africa, but also sustainable development. And big businesses are important. Uh, we've got to start paying, I mean, African governments have to start raising enough taxes that can allow them to run uh, the, the, their business as governments um, to provide <clears throat> public goods and, and things like that and not rely on aid anymore. So what I would like you to talk to us about is, you know, in terms of big businesses, um, are we, are we creating a conducive environment for them to operate in, in South Africa and generally in, in, in Africa? And the other, the other question which comes to mind when we think about um, leadership, especially in entrepreneurship, and this was somehow talked about also before, but how many African, how many public African schools are teaching entrepreneurship? So we talk a lot about, you know, how many Africans get to tertiary level on the continent It's a very small part of the population. So if right now most of the population, what they get is primary and to certain, in certain countries up to secondary school education. Uh, so what are we doing um, in terms of education to uh, nurture uh, future entrepreneurs? Thank you very much. So, uh, Grace, the short answer is that we are not doing enough uh, as a continent to nurture entrepreneurs, because when you look at our school curriculum, you know, there is not much that we are doing to try and actually harness that skill, you know, as it were. But also when you look at how we are cultivating broader leadership, you know, what it is that we are doing as a continent to make sure that we create a new generation of African leaders who are in a position to can create jobs for our growing population, you will see that not enough is being done. And from this perspective, Grace, there is no doubt in my mind that in the creation of, uh, uh, of a new generation of African leaders, education and digital inclusion are going to be catalysts. You know, and I'm glad that everyone this evening, you know, on this uh, uh, engagement is really reinforcing and is being consistent around education as a key catalyst as well as digital inclusion. So it doesn't matter what opportunities you're looking at presenting to the African continent and how you want to look at the sustainable development agenda of Africa, it is clear that the issue of education is critical, you know, to the broader African agenda. So as much as COVID-19 has accelerated the rate of digital technology adoption around the world, it has also revealed the depth of the digital divide worldwide. For millions 
of um, uh, uh, people living in Africa, Grace, who do not have access to the internet or laptops and smartphones, the pandemic has really resulted in greater social and economic isolation. So many school children across Africa received no education after several governments shut down schools as part of the strategy to contain the spread of the virus. I know for a fact, for instance, that in Zimbabwe, schools closed in March 2020, you know, when the, 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 the pandemic hit, and they didn't open uh, for the rest of the year, meaning that those kids who had to write external exams had to sit for those exams in December, not having been in class for nine months. So parents were helpless and they just looked on, especially in remote and rural areas, as nothing could be done about their children's education. There was no instruction, there was no feedback, there was no interaction with their teachers uh, uh, that was actually taking place. Even in cases where this happened, fewer topics and less content was transmitted through distance learning models, either facilitated by the television or radio. So the stats say that as much as 89% of learners across sub-Saharan sub, 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 Africa still do not have access to household computers and 82% lack internet access. Actually, according to the internet world stats figures, as at, 20, uh, 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 as at December 2020, about 634 million people in Africa uh, were internet users, meaning that only 47.6% of the continent's population, you know, had access to the internet. So earlier on, uh, 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 Anish, uh, who's, who was one of the speakers, spoke to the fact that we need to develop African youth so that they can participate in the digital economy, but without digital access, the online learning that will propel us as a continent becomes impossible. And it touches on the lack of basic education as a huge impediment. Now, we all agree uh, with WEF, uh, Grace, that the quality of schooling in a country is, power, is, is a powerful measure of the wealth that countries will produce in the long run. So the acute disparities, therefore, in accessing education in Africa remains a huge challenge and holds the continent backwards in a significant way. So a reset of our education system is necessary, especially if we are committed to unlocking capabilities and harnessing the demographic dividend of the continent. The socioeconomic background of a family uh, in Africa, for instance, should not uh, determine a child's ability to access a quality education or their ability to can become successful in life. And we all know that a lot of us are living proof that education is the most effective tool for development. And we know firsthand that this is one of the shortest ways of lifting yourself and your family from poverty and from one social class to the next. So if as a continent, we cannot even provide these kids with education, and I'm not even talking about decent education, I'm merely referring to basic education. What it means is that we will continue to be known for diseases and poverty as a continent. We are condemning our kids as a continent to being hewers of wood and drawers of water, just like their parents. And just like their parents, these kids will grow up to be dependent on the fiscus through social grants. Right now, just like it is globally, our focus as a continent is on economic recovery. But I'm afraid that our economic recovery efforts as a continent will be elusive because you see countries that will quickly bounce back from this COVID crisis are those with diamond economic structures. You know, where you have 10% of the population being opulent, 10% uh, living in poverty, and you have 80%, you know, who are in the middle class, because we know that it is the middle class that carries economies, not the rich. But the structure of the African continent, uh, unfortunately, has the majority of our people living in abject poverty. And that cannot lend itself to sustainable development. And therefore, what you are asking around the issues of inter and entrepreneurship and what we are doing as a continent to can be able to achieve that, you can see how it also becomes elusive just because of how we are structured as an economy. So to address the digital divide and the challenges that hamper access to quality education, we must think of inclusive and innovative ways of transferring knowledge and digital skills to young Africans in rural and underserved and marginalized areas to enhance their prospects 
of becoming active participants and contributors in the digital uh, and, and, and knowledge economies. And education from where I'm sitting really, we have all agreed as a world that it should be a basic human right and technology is increasingly playing a role in the quality of education and more importantly, how learning is done. So let's agree that with our education system being what it is, the creation of a, a, a entrepreneurs and a creation of a new generation of African leaders that can create jobs for our growing population really remains elusive. As things stand, our African kids have lost the race before they've even begun running. Because you see, most of African countries are open economies, meaning we are not only competing with ourselves, but with the rest of the world. So we are sending our kids out into a world to compete with Asian tigers whose kids have been taught programming from grade five. And in the South African context, we have 80% of grade four as students who cannot read for comprehension. OECD, you know, has ranked our education system 75 out of 76 countries. And our children are behind in maths and science. And we know that these are critical skills that they need to equip themselves with to be able to advance the economy in a meaningful way. So you just need to think about what this does to our competitiveness, you know, as a continent. So it's important that we reset our education because if we do not do so, we are going to continue to lag behind on global uh, stages. So there's a lot that has been done, I think during this time, Grace, by several African governments who have rolled out a number of interventions to facilitate distance learning and uh, a number of great innovations have emerged as a result of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on education, but there is still a need for African governments to boldly pursue a collaborative approach in transforming education and, 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 and ensuring that we enforce digital inclusion by investing in both basic and digital infrastructure. So uh, by laying the groundwork for improved access and services, you know, and, and technologies we will be bridging the gaps in learning and teaching, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is how I think, you know, we can move forward in terms of ensuring that we, 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 we harness entrepre entrepreneurs and we can actually develop a new cadre of leadership, you know, uh, 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 that can be the new generation to propel Africa forward. Thank you very much, Grace. Thank you very much, uh, Busisiwe, uh, for those uh, also insights. Uh, what we are going to do right now, we are going to open the, uh, the panel for questions. So, uh, Mohammed, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. So we don't have that uh, many questions. So we have one uh, from Aisha, and she's uh, she's concerned with the issue of the middle, uh, the missing middle, middle rather. So she said about seventy percent of women in the workforce as it are uh, due to work family conflict. So she has a question: How do we get government policies and regulations uh, to drive sustainable solutions uh, in the private sector? Anyone of you who wants to take that? So Grace, I can give it a step, you know, and, 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 and I like the fact that the question is, is, is asking, a, a, or, or the, 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 the um, a participant is asking a question around what government needs to do, you know, to allow me to say, force the private sector to transform. It is a big theme in South Africa because, you know, even 26 years into democracy, you're still sitting with a private sector that doesn't mimic the South African demographics. And there is a lot that can be done by policy through government to ensure, you know, that we achieve this notion of socioeconomic transformation of, and of ensuring that we can actually level the playing field as it were. So in South Africa, for instance, we've got the triple PE policy. You know, we also have the Affirmative Action Act, but precisely because government is failing to do monitoring and evaluation, you're seeing a situation where, you know, even when companies don't comply, you know, to the targets that have been put by these policies, nothing is actually being done, you know, by a, a, a government to ensure you know, that they can actually force the private sector to can come to the party in a meaningful way. It's unfortunate, however, that we sit in an environment where the private sector has to be forced to do the right thing. 
I think we all agree that we come from an unfortunate history, not just as South Africa, but as Africa, you know, of uh, the majority of the citizens of this continent that were actually deliberately uh, prevented from meaningfully participating in the, uh, 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 in the economy. So we therefore have to understand, especially as the private sector, that we have an obligation, especially if you agree that the private sector is the only social partner with disproportionate resources and therefore a disproportionate voice, we therefore need to look at how are we using our disproportionality to can drive the social economic transformation agenda. Because let's agree that in South Africa's case, for instance, if you're sitting with only 10% of your citizens, you know, who are opulent or who are rich, you know, and you're sitting with a very weak middle class of about 35%, you cannot go to war as a country with only 10% of your citizens, and you cannot achieve the inclusivity agenda. Neither can you achieve the sustainability agenda if the focus is going to continue to be on 10% of the population. So how do we therefore ensure as governments that we put in place policies that are going to force the private sector to can drive the social economic uh, transformation agenda because it is only by doing that that we can achieve the sustainability uh, agenda and focus that we're trying to drive as a continent, Grace. Thank you. OCC, wait, can I add something, Grace, as well? Please, uh, just please. This, because, yeah, one of the things that I've noticed uh, because I know so many entrepreneurs in the quote unquote missing middle is that the ones that are running SMEs, which again are the backbone of many of these economies, one of their chief complaints is not necessarily the government and regulators or policymakers. It's really the tension that comes with having to deal with these financial institutions uh, that are uh, basically ruthless in lending, in their lending practices with the kinds of interest rates that they get charged when they need to borrow money to finance growth. It just becomes extremely frustrating for them because they believe that they, um, again, this all just stacked against them, even though they're the ones who are providing most of the jobs and, the, you know, and they're job creators, they, 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 they feel taken advantage of by a lot of these financial institutions, which is why I also believe as part of the new um, drive towards better information technology uh, as part of the connectivity drive across Africa, we're, we should all work together to create more tools and, and, and fintech solutions that will help a lot of these SME owners in the missing middle to grow their businesses sustainably without you know, always fearing that the bank is always taking advantage of them. Yeah, just uh, one more one question to you, Claude, in relation to the points that you've just raised around funding. So one of the key issues also regarding innovation in education, particularly in Africa, has to do with funding that. So, you know, what are some of, um, from your experience, I know you're just starting, but, you know, from, from your experience, what are some of the lessons that you've learned around um, around trying to source funding for innovation in education? Well, the sad lesson that I've learned and which I learned the hard way, to be honest, Grace, is that Africans don't want to fund Africans. You know, that's what I've learned in my own personal experiences as an entrepreneur. Almost all my funding has come from the United States, even though I'm a native son of Togo and I've been working on these Africa-specific development projects in media, creativity, creative industries, now education for more than two decades, and I found it uh, usually extremely difficult to convince high net worth Africans to fund our ideas and our projects, even after proof of concept phase. And I think that that's something we're going to have to change with respect to the mindset of high net worth Africans, that it's more important to fund the future of Africa, the, the talent of Africa, the creativity of Africa, than to buying apartments, um, to keep buying apartments on Bond Street in London or Avenue Montaigne in Paris. Yeah, absolutely. You know, good point there. Because on the other hand, when you talk to uh, Africans that are trying, like people like you that are trying to do um, important things that can drive development on the continent, what you hear is that when they go to the West, that actually funding has a white face. And it's really difficult for them 
to uh, get their projects funded. But from what you're saying, it's you know it's it's difficult. It's equally or even more difficult uh, to get funding from high net net worth uh, individuals on the continent. So those are things that I think we've got to think about if Africa is looking at also becoming independent uh, financially. That we Africans have to start funding um, their own projects. Any other question, yeah. Mohammed? Yeah, so I have a question and we're talking about inclusive and sustainable economic growth and Africa of recent uh, has been talking about uh, regional integration uh, with the signing of uh, the uh, continental free trade agreement. Uh, to the panelists, what's your view of this or there are more challenges uh, in terms of our uh, economic uh, uh, growth and, and inclu uh, inclusive economic growth and sustainability. Uh, do you see the, the FCA as a starting point or there are more hurdles than prospects? Okay, any one of you who wants to respond to that? Oh, so basically, yeah. okay. Yeah, so Grace, if I may take a step at that, I really think that um, that is a very critical question that is being raised by uh, Mohammed in as far as uh, what the continental free trade agreement, you know, will probably maybe uh, bring to the African continent. It's a great opportunity. And I think it stems from the fact that uh, globalization and trade will going forward be defined by a reorientation of supply chains and manufacturing. And I think we have all realized how COVID-19 has revealed the fragility of the global supply chains, which presents a great opportunity for localization. So from an African business perspective, this means more inwardly focused value chains and regionalization. So as a result of the economic impact in, uh, the, 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 uh, posed by the disruption in supply chains, we are seeing a lot of economies focusing on localization to deal with the risks of being dependent on imports and on China being very central to this, especially in the African context. So the continent in this regard therefore presents opportunities to develop new African continental free trade area corridors. There are great opportunities for greater regional cooperation as well as increased localization via the accelerated a rollout of the African continental free trade uh, area. And I think one of the main focus ought to be dropping trade, uh, ought to be dropping a uh, trade barriers between African countries, which would boost trade on the continent by over 50%. Uh, and, and that is according to some estimates. So the Africa's free trade area can be one of our most important tools for Africa's economic recovery. Our goal as a continent right now really ought to be to establish a single market for goods and services and allow the free movement of business travelers and investment and create a continental customs union to streamline a trade and attract long-term investment. And I think some of the low hanging fruit and opportunities we can start working on are unlocking trade, you know, with West and East Africa's biggest economies, you know, from a West Africa perspective, sea corridors, you know, from Cape Town, Walvis Bay, Lagos, Accra, and from an East Africa perspective, you know, the rail and road uh, corridors present an opportunity from Jobek to Lusaka to Dar es Salaam to Nairobi, you know, and I think this, you know, really uh, 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 impresses on us, you know, that the agreement is a no-brainer from an economic perspective, and this is definitely going to be the world's largest free trade area, and it encompasses countries which have a growing middle class, growing levels of consumption, a number of fast-growing economies, an imminent demographic dividend, and abundant natural resources, you know, increasing levels of peace and security, and a strong commitment to industrialization. So I, I really think that it provides the continent with a market scale to can compete on a global level. So I definitely think that the African uh, continental free trade area and, and, and an agreement is, is an opportunity that we ought to be uh, exploiting as a continent right now. And I know that there is talks around its acceleration. Thank you very much, Grace. Thank you very much for that response. Um, uh, do we have any other question, Mohammed? Or we can no, wrap it. We don't have any. You can take over. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I mean, I think we've had really good insights on what is happening as far as uh, sustainable development is concerned in Africa. Uh, certain goals are being um, um, are met. Others, we have to work a little bit more towards them. And what became clear from the previous um, panel and this one is the role of education. The role of education in achieving sustainable development and also the role of African women. African women cannot be left sitting on the fence if we are going to form part, if we are going to constitute 20% 20 20 of the world population by the turn of this century. So we have to contribute only to the, not to the development of Africa, but but the world as a whole. It's been a privilege and a pleasure to have you with us. So thank you very much, Mr. Claude uh, Graniski, uh, Ms. Josiane Yagubu, and Ms. Busisiwe Mabuso. Thank you for your time and for your insights. I'll thank pass you all so the... much. I do want to say a yeah. big shout out to Josiane as well, because we've known each other since we were children. So it's wonderful to be on the panel together for the first time. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so I'll pass the mic over to um, Thanks, uh, Grace. Grace or, <laughs> or, no, or to, to Robert. Sure. Thank you so much, Grace. Wow, that was really an incredible panel. I think maybe at this point, you know, this is when you're when you're sitting in a big room and you get uh, to hear the sound of applause. So maybe everybody can join me in using uh, our virtual tools uh, on Zoom and really just giving a huge round of virtual applause uh, to all of our participants today. Uh, thank you so much to our moderators. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, and of course, thank you so much, you know, uh, to the Africa Club uh, for putting this incredible uh, events uh, together for us today. Um, so I am going to turn over uh, the floor back over to Prace, uh, the IE Africa Club president. Uh, and I just wanted to let you know that after her message, uh, we will be treated again uh, to a poetic epilogue. Um, from a very dear uh, Kefense Dlamini, who gave us a very nice uh, poetry session during the break. So thank you all very much for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to Praise. Thank you very much, Robert. And wow, how amazing, how awesome was this? We truly believe that these are important conversations that bring about meaningful and durable change on our continent. And so thank you all so, so much. Thanks to our participants today. Thanks to our amazing audience, awesome speakers, moderators, MC, performer, sponsors for their outstanding and constant support. Notably, the IE Africa Center, leader of these initiatives, the IE Foundation, the IE Campus, um, Campus Life, um, Gordon Institute of Business Science at the University of Pretoria, and the IE Book Center. You can also actually use the code Africa Day 21 to receive a 20% discount at the IE Book Store off and online. Last but not least, I would like to thank my phenomenal team members at the Africa Club who worked tirelessly in bringing this event to you. Thank you so, so much, guys. We invite you to join us again next year for an incredible 11th edition of the IE Africa Day Business Forum. Thank you so much. Feel free to stay and listen to the short form extract, extract by um, Kefante. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Hi, hello everyone again. This has been such an honor to be part of. So for my last poem, I'll be doing I Am Africana by Vanessa Chisakula. It's a very, very great poem and I really, really hope you enjoy it. I am Africana, but I'm not a monkey or gorilla or a chimpanzee, yes. We are custodians of the best wildlife. We house the most unique creatures to ever exist in this life from the lions, whose tribe is Judah, the African elephant, the zebra, the cheetah. Have you seen Okapi or looked at the beauty of the mentored Carissa? We do not bite. We are depictions of congeniality. You should go back to learn your A's and B's and not the stories that they've told you because we are all about cultural diversity. We believe in unity, the spirit of Ubuntu. If we're Bashiba Ntuntu from the land 
of the sun, we are natural bird warriors. We are the children of the savannas, the platoons, the mountains and the valleys, the keepers of our grandparents' stories. If Wakanda is something new to you, we have lived our entire lives with the spirit of the Black Panther. This is the blood of Shaka. This is the soil of the greats like Utat Amadiba, and we cannot run away from the legends like great musicianship or unique artistry like Lucky Dube. To them, all of Ndubuzi or Pokonzi, we are Africans. We house the gold, the platinum, the silver, all the way from the corporate belt up to the city of gold. Why do you think they scrambled for Africa? We are the world that exists within the world. We do not believe in banting. We eat what we want to eat. And you are not to welcome guests in your house if you do not want to ask them what they have to eat. We are professionals of cultural colored cuisines, as colorful as our clothes, as we wrap ourselves in our chitenge kente or our ankara or our dashiki not forgetting to wrap ourselves in our beautiful hair ties. After all, we are the birthplace of civilization. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Thank you, Kefente. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time. We'll see you next year. Bye-bye. Thank you.